we are experiencing a renaissance of robotics and artificial intelligence. In recent years, we've seen computers drive our cars and trucks, translate and interpret natural languages, and defeat the world's champions of chess, Go, and Jeopardy. IBM's Watson is now, or soon will be, the world's leading oncology expert. And the new AI is fueling the robot revolution. In my own work, I've been able to contribute to this revolution in areas including manufacturing, where feeling is required for mechanical assembly or grinding, and in autonomous vehicles, which will soon be commercial products, offering us greater safety and convenience, in machines that sense and interpret their environments with applications such as voice-controlled smart wheelchairs, and in robotically-assisted, minimally invasive surgery with the promise of faster, more precise operations with lower trauma and less risk of infection, as well as service robots such as tour guides and sentries, and in humanoid robots that can operate in domestic environments and can navigate over difficult terrains, and can operate controls like valves, levers, switches, and buttons, or operate power tools designed for humans, or behave as co-workers collaborating with humans. These results from my lab and many others around the world are now emerging into new robots and emerging into our lives. Of course, there are applications in dull, monotonous, and repetitive tasks, but there are also new applications in tasks that require superhuman strength, speed, precision, reliability, total recall, or unflinching focus of attention. Why is this happening? Why now, and how will it change our lives? As a career roboticist, I've lived through the robot depression. I used to advise my students, don't call yourself a roboticist, you won't get a job. But in recent years, I've seen that turned upside down. My students are getting great jobs specifically for their robotics expertise. From my perspective, this has come about from two important changes. One is the evolution of the new AI, specifically deep learning. And the second is a fundamental change in the way that we program robots. Let me first give you a little background on deep learning. What is it? Where did it come from? The foundations of deep learning come from brain science. We all know that brains are made up of neurons interconnected with synapses. And from there, we generate all thought, action, memories, perception, emotions, feelings. But exactly how this is done has been a longstanding challenge. Neuroscientists have studied neurons down to the molecular level, and we understand in detail how they communicate. With release of neurotransmitters and responsiveness of ion channels, scientists have even demystified the act of learning by tagging ion channels and watching their migration through dendrites and an installation into synapses. This is watching learning under a microscope, the physiological manifestation of learning, a biological change. You, by listening to this talk, are biologically changed. And we take our knowledge of these, and we wrap them up into mathematical models, and we program these into computer simulations. And so, neurons are the building blocks of brains, and simulated neurons are the building blocks of the new AI. But it's not enough to understand how neurons work. We have to understand how they're interconnected, how are their synapses formed. And for this, we get knowledge from biology. For example, the horseshoe crab. The horseshoe crab is an ancient creature with primitive eyes, and scientists have been able to disentangle the axons from their primitive light sensors and found that they're connected in patterns, creating the equivalent of computing tissue that performs low-level image processing. These synapses are not an accident or random. These are dictated by the DNA of the creature because these synaptic values perform useful computations. And we learned more from the Nobel Prize-winning work of Hubel and Wiesel studying the visual cortex of the cat they found more of these innate connections among neurons. Notably, there are collections of neurons in the retina that can detect light-dark changes, like the horseshoe crab. And these bits project onto deeper neurons that assemble these into line segments at different displacements and angles. And these project onto deeper neurons that assemble them into geometric patterns. And so we see, not only are there patterns of connections at synapses, but there's also an organization by layers of abstraction. So we've learned more about how at least ensembles of neurons are connected together. But are we ready to build brains? Maybe. We get insight and inspiration from biologists studying the behavior of creatures. An example is the ghost crab. The ghost crab has a behavior in that it lives in a burrow in the sand and emerges periodically to enter the sea. If you chase it, it runs quickly to the sanctuary of its burrow. 
It appears to have a strong reflex for self-preservation and good strategies for survival. But if while the crab is out, you cover its burrow with a metal plate, and when it reemerges, you chase it, it runs towards its burrow and it stops on top of the plate. And at this point, you can just walk over and pick it up. And so, although the ghost crab has a biological brain, it reveals itself to be indistinguishable from a robot. It has a program which is normally effective, but it has no room for creativity or innovation. And so we're emboldened to try to build our primitive brains, and we put together what we've learned, our knowledge of neurons in simulations, patterns of interconnections in synapses, and layers of abstraction. And these form what are called deep neural networks. Now, the trick to getting useful computations out of a deep neural network is to discover good synaptic weights, like the horseshoe crab. The process of this discovery is called deep learning. Now, we knew about many of these discoveries much earlier, but they were never successful until recently. And part of the reason is this discovery of good synaptic values requires intensive computations. And we've been helped recently by the emergence of new computing hardware, notably the graphical processing unit, or GPU. These were originally developed for computer gaming, but they were found to be effective for the intensive computations for discovery of synapses. A second critically important development was the emergence of big data. We all know that companies such as Facebook, Amazon, and Google are amassing huge repositories of labeled information, and the ease of gathering data over the internet leads to the creation of new repositories springing up around the world, and this is essential for training the new networks. Because they still learn very slowly, we, re we require both intensive computations and literally millions of examples. But the results have been stunning. Now computers can interpret images semantically. They can say, that is a pedestrian, that is a bicyclist, that is a car, that is my road, and this is necessary for effective autonomous vehicles or for robots behaving intelligently in factories or in homes. Applications of deep learning are springing up everywhere. Facial recognition, recognition of emotions, interpretation of natural languages, even patent searches, and an avalanche of new applications on the horizon. And these dramatically better brains are spurring the rise of the robots. The second important development for the rise of the robots was a fundamental change in how we program them, as built into the robot operating system, or ROS. In my career, I've seen decades of robot projects that started from scratch and invested all of their resources only to recreate results of the past. We were not building on foundations. We were not making progress by reinventing the wheel. We we're not protecting our advances and reusing them and integrating them with others. And Ross has changed all of this by bringing modern software engineering techniques to robots. Ross was innovated at Stanford's Artificial Intelligence Lab and was nurtured for nine years by Google, and it's now emerged as the de facto standard robot programming environment around the world. I was not a founder of ROS, but I am a convert. I am a user, a contributor, a teacher, and an evangelist. Most recently, I've also written a textbook in pursuit of my desire to train and recruit the next generation of roboticists. The number of robots, the variety of robots using ROS is exploding. Old robots are being converted to ROS. New robots are born with ROS. The existence of ROS has led to the creation of new robot startup companies. And ROS has spread throughout the world, in academia, in industry, in research labs. And now we're seeing experts in Tokyo, in Edinburgh, in Cleveland, who are contributing their expertise in modules like Lego blocks that can be assembled in new novel systems in California, in Australia, and in China. And for the first time, we we're able to create robots that are more sophisticated than any one person or any one research group could do in a lifetime. Dramatically better robots are coming out, and we can expect dramatic changes in our life. One of the things we expect will make a difference is jobs. A recent McKinsey study estimated that half of all human labor can be replaced by a robot or a machine enabled with artificial intelligence. They also identified over 70 professions in which 90% of the human content can be eliminated, ranging from stock pickers to truck drivers. A recent study showed that loss of manufacturing jobs in the United States was attributable to automation, not outsourcing. Robots are taking our manufacturing jobs. And it's not just in manufacturing, it's across the spectrum. For example, in logistics, like Amazon automated distribution centers, or in design with 3D printers, in home automation, 
in security and defense, agriculture and food, healthcare, energy. Elon Musk warns that there will be fewer and fewer jobs, that a robot cannot do better than a human. And Stephen Hawking worries that there will only be jobs for the most exceptional humans. But throughout modern history, it's been predicted that technological advances would lead to massive job layoffs. And historically, this has not been true. In the 1800s, the Luddites protested automation and the textile industry by smashing weaving machines. But ultimately, these machines increased employment in the industry and increased wages. Overall, the Industrial Revolution elevated the lives of the common worker. In the 20th century United States, we began with 40% of our workforce involved in farming. And with introduction of technology, this fell to 2% by the end of the century. But there was not a massive jobs collapse. Instead, there was jobs growth. There was wealth increase as we largely moved into manufacturing, including in sectors that had been undreamed of in the past. And the introduction of the computer into business was predicted to lead to massive layoffs. And certainly, businesses became more efficient. But there were not massive layoffs. There was increase in employment and increased salaries. Today, you can't run a business without a computer. And the existence of the computer has made startups easier. And as we lost our manufacturing jobs, we gained new jobs in the service sector. To a large extent, we gave up dull, dirty, and dangerous manufacturing jobs for knowledge workers. And so, we have reason to believe there will not be a robot apocalypse, but a robot utopia. A world where robots do all of the dirty, dull, and dangerous work for us. And that humans working together with robots increase the value of human labor, increase productivity, and increase wealth. And we will still need doctors, therapists, poets, writers, researchers, teachers, musicians, composers, comedians, actors, athletes, dancers, and artists, and countless others who elevate and enrich our lives. And we can expect with our newfound wealth, we'll be able to enjoy these arts and entertainment and travel and leisure. Robots will become our laborers and also our assistants and our advisors our servants and our guardians and our companions. Robots will become commonplace and indispensable in our lives, and this will give birth to a new basic industry and generate millions of jobs involved in the creation of ever more capable machines. Tomorrow's roboticists will face a fundamental grand challenge to create robots in our image, but that ultimately surpass human strength, speed, precision, intelligence, and most importantly, compassion, and ethics. Addressing this grand challenge will require a collaboration among contributors with greater multidisciplinary breadth than any time in history. Of course, we'll need more engineers and computer scientists, but we'll also need philosophers, linguists, psychologists, psychiatrists, neuroscientists, biologists, skill experts, and countless more knowledge workers. The result of this grand challenge will be a transformational elevation of human life. And so, yes, the robot revolution is here. But it's not to be feared, but to be embraced as our hope for the future. Thank you.